You're now listening to that hot fire. Dracarys. Today, again, I have my co-host Leland Johnson joining me on the show. How you doing? It might get a little personal. This might make you feel a certain kind of way. It definitely has to be discussed. We're gonna be talking about being coached. What makes an athlete coachable? Coaching the athlete. If you're an athlete, student athlete listening to this, are you coachable? Sports parents, is your kid coachable? So some of the things that we've been discussing, myself and Leland, me, J.B. Barnes, uh, within the seven on seven uh, football season and other head coaches, you know, around the Portland metro area is what makes a kid coachable versus a kid that's not coachable. So I'm going to open this up with some of the qualities and traits that seem to be universal across the country and around the world in terms of athletes being coachable versus athletes that are not. And some of the things that or qualities that might be on the negative side of kids not being coachable is that when you talk to them, one, they don't make eye contact. When you're talking to them, they have a tendency to sometimes walk off or be at the back of the group. Mm -hmm. And then at other times they can roll your eyes at you when you're trying to give them criticism. And I'm talking about positive and constructive criticism. So the other thing that we've seen is that when you have sports parents who might have coached, who might be currently coaching and have and maybe played at a decent level where they might have a tendency to undermine you at the dinner table. And often what I found is that that energy comes off in practice and games. So Leland, I want to open this up with you. We're talking about an athlete being coachable versus the athlete that's not coachable. In your experience, how have you encountered or what qualities or traits have you seen from maybe the young student athlete and probably their parents when they've not been coachable? What's been some universal things that you found in your research or your past experiences? Well, um, normally, like, the one thing you hit on there was, was like, really you true. Speak up. Is uh, you can often see, or, or through the child, you can often see what they're talking about at home. <laughs> because whatever they're talking about at home is going to, it's, it's going to come out in that relationship between you and the kid. And the reason why I say this is I had a friend, um, Richard Bonton, and I was discussing this very issue with him. And we were talking about a young athlete who now is playing pro ball overseas. And um, we were discussing the parent aspect. And I said, well, First of all, let me tell you this. He said, what? I said, uh, it's a lot of negative stuff being said to him towards uh, me and other coaches. How would you tell? He was like, how you know? How you know? So I go, okay, this is what we'll do. The next time we see the kid, um, watch how he, he addresses you and then watch how he addresses me. Okay. And it was self-evident. It was... One was a good handshake for him. The other one was, hey, what's up? And it bothered my friend so much, he went back to the kid's dad and, and brought this very subject up. The kid came back, apologized to me, and uh, it helped Richard to see that there, there's sometimes some manipulative stuff going on in the background that coaches have to get over. Uh, I've always been the type who took the attitude that uh, I wanted my kid to be successful if I wasn't around. So if I wasn't there to give him that special treatment, I had to explain to him that he was going to be in situations and test it. And when th those times come about, then he has to address it in a certain way. Um, and, and, and that, again, that comes from being in the moment and allowing yourself to 
um, open your mind up to different predicaments and different situations. Every coaching situation I had was not a, a, a dream situation. But um, rather than confront the coach about my issues, again, I took care of what I could handle, what I had control of. And I know I had control of his ability to get better as a because I trained him. And um, if I had enough time, then we could semi overcome any situation that was going to be before us. So I hear what I hear is a couple of things, ladies and gentlemen, is that in your first example, Leland, you know, talking about the gentleman that went and played overseas is that it sounds like him, whether it's his mom and dad or his dad, they're having these conversations that when you give your opinion, you can be given the best of opinions. Maybe even you're right. Yeah. A lot of times you could be right. But when you say things in a way that blame, degrade and offend your son's coach, he is going to internalize that. And eventually that energy is going to come off towards the coach. I've seen this go a number of ways. I've seen this go a number of ways in the sense that that kid and that coach is going to develop a negative relationship because he's going to be looked at as the problem student athlete. Right. And then if the sports parent is riling the coach or always questioning the coach's decisions on the field with video cameras, wants to call the coach after every game, mm -hmm. sometimes after practice and complaining about playing time or the strategy or the tactics of the game, that can possibly irritate that head coach or that assistant coach. And now, let, now, let, me, let me come from a different uh, position from the coach's, coach's mm -hmm. side. Sometimes we think of coaches as machines. We don't think they have emotions. We don't think they're affected by opinion. We don't think they're affected by just, just everyday stuff that goes along. When you allow yourself to understand that coach is a, is a human, then you will start to make, I, I think you will start to make some better decisions as far as your relationship with the coach, um, your kid, and the kid with your coach. Uh, so you, you gotta, you can't forget they're human. They receive criticism on the daily, whether it's, whether it's correct criticism or wrong, they're being criticized. Every day. Every day. Every day. So you have to take that in mind as a parent when you're trying to have that relationship with that coach. And if you do, then I think you'll find that door will start to open. You'll start to, like, like my man said in the lens, it's better to find your commonalities than to sit back and talk about your differences, what you think, what your point of view is opposed to his point of view. Find out what his commonalities are. He may be a defensive-oriented coach. Well, if you haven't been teaching defense and you've been primarily teaching offense in training sessions, it would behoove you to change your little program up so that when you start to encounter uh, his workouts, you, you have some idea with what he wants or you know, what his idea is or what's the most important to him. So. You know what, Leland, I like that. And what I hear you saying is that sports parents, if you're listening right now, student athletes, if you're listening right now, I hope y'all are both together because when you encounter a new coach or if you transfer schools or you transfer like youth football teams, baseball, basketball organizations or AAU organizations, it's not so much about what that team is doing to win. I know you've been attracted to them somehow and I know players recruit other players. But you got to learn about that coach and their philosophy, learn that coach's core values. So then if you have a like you said, if you've been practicing a lot of offense and you're offensive minded and you encounter a coach that's defensive minded, mm -hmm. you're going to want to get on the same page with that. And one thing that you've talked about in the past, Leland, is learning the system, mastering the system. The fundamentals, whether whatever, if you're in a spread system, if you're in a wing T system, if you're in an air rate system, if you're in a run and shoot system, whatever it is that you're in, learn it, master the fundamentals, 
the fundamentals and you often say so you can find the freedom mm -hmm. in the system. So you might not necessarily like everything about this system. Like if you're right. a star receiver and somehow you wind up in a wing T offense, you have to learn to block now. Right. right. You know, you might have to do crack back blocks, but what if you still catch five to six balls a game for 150 yards? Because there's a multitude of things in that system that you must do to make yourself um, successful. And, and the player that understands that there are a multitude of ways that I can impress the coach. There's a multitude of ways where I can be seen. There's a multitude of ways where I can show my effectiveness on the team. If I approach it from this standpoint, um, make not only shooting my priority, make rebounding a priority of mine. Make defense a priority of mine. Mm -hmm. Make setting picks a priority of mine. Um, uh, uh, there's a multitude of things in a basketball game or a football game that a player can do that, that can win over a coach. And once they understand that, that it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have the ball in order to impress him. But once they understand that and they start Kyle Lowrying it, and I say Kyle Lowry because if the next time you watch the Raptors in the championship game, uh, Watch how many times he's in the paint taking charges from players that are two or three times uh, bigger than he is. <laughs> you watch those things, and you don't have to wonder why he's in the position he's in because he's not the most uh, talented uh, point guard in the league. He's not the most skillful point guard in the league. Hart, he got an abundance of that. And his understanding of the game. He puts himself in position where when they start looking at his player usage, it's a plus. It's not a minus. He's efficient. He's very efficient. So, and, and I like that because what you want to be as a student athlete to really be coachable, parents, your kids are going to appear more coachable. They're going to get treated how you want them to get treated when they work on all facets of their game. It doesn't matter what sport they're playing. So I think that's beautiful because when a coach sees you working on, if you're a basketball player, you got a good shot. Can you dribble? Can you dribble with your left hand? Do you know how to get assists? Can you play defense? When you're in the game, do things happen? Right. Offensively and defensively. So to really be coachable, you got to really work on a, a well-rounded game and do the things that you need help with the most. And sometimes that might be conditioning. Sometimes that might be strength. Sometimes that might be skills and drills to make yourself a better player. And a coach is going to see that you're coachable when you're ready to go through. It might be a practice where you work literally a two hour practice and you spend 45 minutes working on left hand dribbles right, or, right. or one step or two step or what is it? The Euro step to the right. hoop. Like just what you bringing up this subject, kind of, it kind of uh, make, reminds me of a situation you had with one of your kids, um, uh, the Snyder kid. Uh, oh, Logan Wilson. Logan Wilson, okay. I say Snyder because it's mom. mom. Yeah, different last name. And, and I'm going to mention her too in this, but she was a classic example of a parent who opened their mind um, and accepted your criticism, trusted you, and now our son is in a totally different position today. That's correct. Um, Cause I remember when you, you picked up the phone and you was a little upset cause she got upset because you gave a, uh, a very blunt uh, example of his actions to him. And she felt at that particular time, like you was pointing the finger and she didn't understand what you were doing was, you was basically bringing over that, bringing him over that threshold of manhood, and making him responsible for some of the things that you may have thought that he wasn't doing to his mm -hmm. best of ability. And and she's the classic case of she got upset, she got a little peed off. You're the classic case of um, I'm a confident coach, and I'm not gonna address it in a certain way. I'm gonna just let her figure it out for herself. And that's exactly what happened. Um, he's going to go a long way 
because now she'll be able to reflect on this situation with you and and it'll it'll give her the ability to do that with the next coach you know what is it's beautiful that you're saying this leland because coaches if you're listening to this this is important because you have to have confidence when you demand respect you demand order and you demand discipline now the student athlete that's coachable is going to be respectful they're going to appreciate order. Things are done a certain way to be successful. And then they're also going to respect discipline mm -hmm. because this is, we're speaking about, we're teaching life skills right. through sports. Right. And oftentimes you run into kids that they don't have discipline. They don't have order. And, and a lot of times, Leland, you've seen it. They don't even respect their adults. They don't respect their teachers. So how are they going to come to this team and respect you? True. And then that's when sometimes us as coaches, we have to be patient and get to know a kid to understand their situation. I'm not saying coddle them. I don't do that. I'm not that type of a coach. You can call me old school if you want to, but I'm, I'm, I'm not about coddling kids. I'm about understanding their emotions, giving them praise when it's definitely uh, due and deserved. But at the same time, I haven't found any great coaches in the past 50 to 100 years. There's always respect, there's always order, and there's always discipline in how their programs were described. True, true. And I think as coaches, we should understand this. We should take from different areas of our life and, and make it applicable to what we do as coaches. I often say this, I use this uh, when I start talking to my kids at the beginning of a training session. And I go, um, first thing that I want you guys to understand is before I became a coach, I was a parent. So I have a, ch a child that's been through this on the athletic side, but I was also an involved parent in his academics also. Right. I was also an involved parent on how he addressed adults and how he carried himself in society. So, you know, um, those, those things are a necessity. They're, they're, they're a necessity for a kid's growth. And the person that promotes that and pushes that is the parent or the person that's inside the house and has the most time to spend with that kid. I, I found out in the past, sometimes I would, I'd be watching TV and I'd see a, something happen on the tube. And it was such a great advantage to have, say, hey, Jazz, come here. Look, that was the one thing he had over every other kid in my organization because their parents weren't as intuitive or that didn't come to them in the moment. But there were a whole bunch of moments like that. There were, I can't even count them on two sets of hands and feet. You know, that I would, hey, uh, come here, let me show you. But those moments were important. Yeah, yeah. and speaking of those moments, Leland, you're talking about your, uh, your mental approach with jazz to be not only coachable on a team, but being a good student and right. then being a good member of the community right. that you live in. What are some tips and strategies that you would share with our audience on mental work or things that they can do to make their young student athlete more coachable or to appear more coachable? Um, always, always uh, take your emotions completely out of the situation. When I say your emotions, your emotions are your love for your kid. Um, take that completely out of the situation and treat your son or your daughter as if they weren't yours. Mm. That's kind of deep right there. It, it is. It, That's it is. almost stoic, too. And it's difficult for a parent that, that's been loving on their kid since the day he was born. But it is a necessary avenue you have to travel down if you want your child to make it through situations when mm. you are not around. That's right. Um, Last year, a lot of people on the face of it would say, Jazz had a great year last year. Only him and I would sit back and talk about 
the difficulties of, of what he had to get over. Um, I've often gave this example of his beginning adventures. And there was, uh, when he came to me and he said, Dad, I had a great summer. He got an award for the summer as far as fitness was concerned. Um, I got daily calls from coaches, not say weekly calls from coaches about his improvement and what he was doing and how he was doing it. But when it came down to the, the game and actually playing the first game of the season, when Jazz actually looked at the landscape, he said, hold on, there's 12 people on this team and it looks like uh, I'm number 10. Now, in that situation, this is where what we did in the past came into play. Had I coddled him, had I made him feel like, call me and I'll make you feel better, but with my, wor with my words right. and everything, um, he would have had a totally different mind state. Uh, I'm not going to say he wasn't emotional. He got emotional. But because of the way we are, I had to say, man, shut up. <laughs> you're here to compete. You're competing for a job. And if you're not thinking about you're competing every moment that you're on campus, every moment that you're under contract for this scholarship, mm -hmm. then just go ahead and give it back and quit. Mm -hmm. Because that's not the nature of this beast. Shut up and do what you need to do. What is he asking you to do? He's just asking me to shoot the ball and I don't get a chance to do anything else. How many times is he asking you to shoot the ball? Well, I only get four shots. I said, hold on a minute, man. Look at it from this perspective. Do you consider yourself as an individual that wants to be a professional basketball player one day? Yes. Would you consider or would you say that when I'm a professional, that I'm very good at what I do and I'm efficient at what I do? Yeah. Well, if he's giving you four shots to hit, I, I think what you should do is you should make your training and I'll help you do this or change it up to the point where when he needs you to hit four shots, you hitting at least three out of your four shots, pal. That's and right. if you don't get any more after that, that's fine. The results of that was he went from that point to shooting 57% from the field mm -hmm. at one time during the year, 57% from the three-point line. He ended his year 45.2, 45.2, 2. 45% from the three-point line. That's well above average. But his mentality was not of a quitter. His mentality is, is, one, is, is that of one that I have to work myself through it. And as a trainer, you just put him in the position where it's an efficient workout, not a workout where you're getting a multitude of shots off. Got and you. you. You understand what I'm saying? Well, you're hitting 100 shots, but you may have missed 75. We don't want to do that. We want to take a certain amount of shots, and out of those shots, we want to know what our percentage is. You feel me? Yeah. So that's how we attacked it. Yeah, and what, and what I know about him and guys that he's trained with and now I know he's been in the facility training with us, guys like Jazz Johnson, Coyote Rufi, Majib Rufi, Brian Kelly, Julius Shellmeyer, Sprinter. Congrats, Julius. I know they're getting ready for nationals at the University of Oregon, 4x100. Is that the quality? And I'll mention Grace Zilber, volleyball player at uh, University of Portland. parents or the guardians with the mental work, the external motivation isn't there when they meet other uh, athletes that are at their caliber. And I've often seen, I've often seen them make excuses for errors, mm -hmm. have bad attitudes, not make eye, con eye contact with the coach when it's time for constructive criticism. And if you're a student athlete and you're, and you're a parent that's just tuning in, it's okay to lose. It's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. It's what you do after that. It's how you approach it. And are you willing to point the finger at yourself when it comes to your preparation? So coaching and being coachable is all about preparation. Sure so that's is. another quality. You have to be diligent about your preparation. 
Leland, you were going to make a point. Um, yesterday, I ran into an athlete of yours over at Pace. Oh, Brian Kelly and, was and, in the building. And another thing that we didn't mention that, that must be a, 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 a must-have trait, humility. Being, Being coachable, it, it definitely, go, go ahead. Man, I was so impressed with Brian Kelly yesterday and his humility. Um, there was a situation where Brian, because me and you shared this information about his high school experience. Right. And how his coaches weren't really um, supportive. How it appeared. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it appeared, and, and from this comment, I guess... It was, it was a fact. It was a fact. And he, we were talking, and he said, yeah, there was a kid who played at Camus, and he came to the school that I was playing at. and On a said, recruiting visit. Yeah. Right? And, at, uh, and going, to, going to school. He's, he's at the University of San Diego going, to, going into a senior year playing defensive back, free safety, strong, strong safety. He uh, said the kid was coming to school because they went to the same high school and the kid was like, yeah, man, coach told me a lot about you, man. And what's a, and the humility that was on his face when he made this comment, I was impressed with it. And he looked at the both of us and was like, yeah, I don't mess with coach like that. And it came out so cool. I was, I was just taken aback and I was like, okay, he does have a real good chance at playing professional football one day. And people looking at it from the outside will look at, well, he goes to this school and he doesn't play for a powerhouse. And that quality is what's going to shoot him ahead when he's in the room with all of those guys that you think are the top athletes. That's right. Or the guys that you think is going to be playing on Sunday. Because if you look at an NFL roster, a lot of those rosters aren't full, filled up with the University of Alabama Power players. Power five kids. They're not. They're, they're, hey, one of the best linemen I've ever, uh, offensive linemen i ever known to play the game uh, for the Dallas Cowboys came from Humboldt State. You know what I'm saying? Larry Allen. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He came from Humboldt State. So if you got good coaches that know how to teach good position, good position, uh, 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 player position uh, fundamentals. That's right. That's half of your battle. Mm -hmm. How and you take in that information. That's another part of your mm -hmm. battle. Yeah, how do you take in information? How do you process it? Well, from what I seen in Mr. Kelly yesterday, uh, I, I even told Majib, I said, man, you need to go, stay, to go hang around Brian a little bit. And Again, from an athlete standpoint. Mm -hmm. And they oh, already know each other. You know, oh, yeah, we're well, going to do some stuff. Get I said, no, no, no. Even though you're a good guy, I just want you to see how he carries himself. And that also told me that the job his dad did. His dad did a great job of, you know, not babying him, not, not putting stuff in his face that at the time he may have thought was a little harsh. Yeah. But I guarantee Preach. you, I guarantee you, I guarantee you if you was to talk to him now, because what I seen yesterday was a dude. Yeah, you, you know, I, I really appreciate you seeing that, Leland, yesterday with him being humble. And, it, and it's really interesting because, you know, I've had a chance to go to his games in high school as a junior, senior, get his footage when he, you know, him playing at University of San Diego and give him little critiques. Right. We're way beyond critiquing in the rate room, sprint training. You know, this is a well-rounded, holistic approach as far as, like, our understanding of sports. Right. He knows how to handle criticism. He doesn't get insecure when it comes to that because he hasn't been coddled. There's no but if I did this or excuse making. Right. And what we've often found, ladies and gentlemen, with kids that appear to be uncoachable, is that they make excuses, they don't want to take responsibility, and it's always somebody else's fault. True, true. You know, so we're getting into the fourth quarter. You know, the biggest thing that I've been experiencing, Leland, in the coaching world is that are you shouting 
or are you just raising your voice when you want to get your point across as a coach? Nowadays, you can't even raise your voice or it's considered shouting. It's tough. Coach is a, you know, uh, an asshole. I might as well go out and say it. And we know coaches aren't like that. We might be raising our voice to make a point. It's not an assault against your personality or character in the heat of the moment. Again, you have sports like football, baseball, basketball. These are emotional and passionate sports. True. So, you know, we always want to reflect, take time to reflect 24, 48 hours after certain competitions or performances, you know, and then have a conversation. But you, you, you were going to make a point. Well, coaching has changed. Coaching is cerebral nowadays. It's not, it's not a drill sergeant type mm -hmm. of uh, uh, situation anymore. It used to be that you could come in and if you reacted like a hard ass and you, I want this respect, they would automatically give it to you. And, and we, we describe this generation as simple, but in some ways they're very, they're very complex. They're, they're simple in a way where the things that we see, the, the uh, things that bring a personality out of you, and they may be a little difficult on, on an individual. Um, they, see, they don't see the value in that. But in the same token, um, you can't bullshit them. That's right. You can't bullshit today's athlete. They may not have the work ethic. And the, and the ingenuity that we had, um, because a lot of things are done for them, but you can't fool them. If, if you're not confident in what you do, you can no longer be a part-time coach. You, you, you have to put something else into it. You have to pick up books like The Lens. You have to pick up books like uh, uh, the science of sports master, the science of sports, being mastery. able to, you know, read Rasmus Ankerson's book, the gold mine, the gold mine effect. You, you, know. you have to educate yourself in the other ways that other coaches try to motivate and get to their athletes. Um, we read Tim Grover's book and, and, and we learned about cleaners and closers, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, that was a very important book for me because I then began to see the kids I could really push in the beginning mm -hmm. and the kids I had to kind of like set, you know, pull back on. You, you feel me? So um, coaching is not, it's not, um, I think one, they should get paid more uh, because uh, people don't really recognize some of the stuff that they go through. Um, and even, we as uh, trainers slash coaches, uh, we get it a little bit more <laughs> harder than your regular coach does because we tend to get more personal with the athlete and help them with more personal That's endeavors right. in their lives. You know, and, and, and we all, not only are we uh, uh, strength coaches, not only are we coaches in a particular skill set, but we tend up being end up being uh psychologists and oh, you, be, you become a lot of <laughs> a lot of things you know you become a surrogate parent yeah. you know an assistant coach you know a uncle a big brother you know there's a lot you're the counselor you're the psychologist sometimes you're the referee when uh if two parents are divorced and then you have a child in the middle it becomes very complex and you're often thinking about these situations in social and social and emotional dynamics late into the night because we're problem solvers. Yes, and we, we want everybody to feel comfortable. So because the, the interest is the kid, the interest is the student athlete and we want the student athlete to be successful. We want the student athlete to be coachable, but sometimes us as a coach, we got to help the kid or help the parent teach the kid how to be coachable. I brought this subject up because I was going through this with one of my kids. Um, some of the parents that we deal with, and I think I brought this up before with you, are professionals. And I think those professionals look at athletics as simplistic. Some do. Some I've do. Experienced that. The majority of them do. And if you get one that's, let's say, he's an engineer, okay? Come on, guys. You got to have some wits in order to be an engineer. So you, 
think of it from this aspect. When he looks at sports, sometimes he doesn't look at it as that difficult. But what they don't respect is the same time you spend at your profession, you and I are spending that time with our profession. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we turn it on just because we come to the gym. Once we leave the gym, we're, we're, we're going to study certain things about mm -hmm. difficulties that our athletes are having so that we, so that we have the wherewithal and the know-how to help them get through it. Because if they, we don't find out, guess what he's going to do? He's going to go to somebody where he can find that that's out. Right. And, and if I'm trying to do this as a business, that's, that's, that's a client I just lost. That's right. Because I didn't take the time to educate myself about that particular issue or problem. So um, a, a, a lot of this, again, it, it comes back. It comes back to you, you got to kind of, with today's athletes, you have to adjust. Uh, get a little bit more personable, find out what, what they want. What the other day I was in the gym and I'm watching a little girl and she's doing, she's, she's left in doing a leg press. No, she was actually doing some squats. And I, you know, the way she was going about it, I was impressed. I thought, oh, hey, so you going to college, what sports you play? She hit me with this one. I ain't playing no sports. This is, this is for recreation with me. I'm like, that intense? She said, yeah, this is just, I'll do intramurals, but my profession is the books. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, all right. So you do your thing, have fun with it. She said, I will, thank you for asking. You know, so you get those types, we get those types also. And some of them, those kids are probably more of a delight to coach and train than the, the competitive athletes that we have, so. They're coachable. Yeah, very coachable. Leland, uh, what else would you like to add before we close out? Uh, as a parent of a, of a, a student athlete, patience, open-mindedness are keys to your being a part of your child's growth. If you don't, uh, if you don't acquire those things early on in your um, your, your journey, it's going to be difficult and you're going to run into situations where coaches are want to, they're going to want to exclude you or have you out of the way. Mm -hmm. You have to remain open-minded again, find out what his, if he and you have any commonalities. And if you have those commonalities, address them, talk about them, you know, show him that, that, you kind of understand what he's going through and what his ide ideology is. Um, if you're in a position where you and the coach aren't on the same page, the best thing is to do is don't say any negative things to your child about the coach. Um, uh, um, if, if you were to have any input, make sure it's in a personal environment and not out in front of that's right said coach yes you follow those things i think you'll be okay ladies and gentlemen I, I want to thank you for joining us today if you didn't learn anything to be or to appear more coachable you have to make eye contact when the coach is speaking to you give him or her a head nod to let them know that you understand and sports parents above all do not be at the dinner table berating, degrading, belittling, or blaming the coach for your son or daughter. <laughs>
developing discipline, showing them how to develop a growth mindset and expand their mind in the form of reflective thinking. This is the place you want to be. This is course. I want you to work through this course with your student athlete. It's not for them to go at it alone. This is a gap. This is a way to bridge the gap between the student athlete and sports parent and the student athlete and the coach. Check out my course, The Edge, at sportsmastery.thinkific.com. I'll also have a link in the show notes. 